You can drive a robot today through any arbitrary trajectory in space, passively or actively, with this control technology, and it really kind of is underutilized at this point. It's kind of like a, a solution without a problem, you know, but I think the problem can be brought to the solution in this case. Welcome to The Future Of, a podcast by Fresh Consulting, where we discuss and learn about the future of different industries, markets, and technology verticals. Together, we'll chat with leaders and experts in the field and discuss how we can shape the future human experience. I'm your host, Jeff Dance. In this episode of The Future Of, we're exploring the future of cobotics. We're joined by Mike Oren, a cobot guru and expert, uh, an OEM manager at Thermo Fisher, and also the founder of Kevin Robot. We're here to explore the future of Cobotics. Welcome. It's a pleasure to have you with me on this episode. Pleasure to be here, Jeff. Hey, if we can start with telling the listeners a little bit more about your experience, and you know, particularly with Cobotics, um, can we start there? Sure, absolutely. I I, uh, I was lucky to find my career before I went to college. So I, I went around a car factory as a tour and here in, in Germany, in fact, that's where I am now. And I uh, had the opportunity to watch a bunch of robots putting cars together. And the rest is history. I was hooked all the way through college, uh, went off and found a, a way to work for a robotics company um, immediately right out of school. And uh, that was that was great. And you know, along the way, you find yourself working with customers. You know, if you're working for a robotics company, it's it's probably, one, I'd say one of the coolest parts of the job is the fact that you get to see so many different applications. A lot of things people never get to see, you know, laser welding or laser cutting or even, you know, uh, a- applications that are just purely R&D uh, using articulated robots. So I had that opportunity well, one of the applications I was called into was a, at the time, a little startup called Restoration Robotics. And people always confuse this with restoration hardware, but I'm, I'm hinting at the fact that I ended up working for a customer, which is exactly what I did. I left uh, the manufacturer and went to a customer. Uh, but it, the idea is restoration was a hair restoration robot so using an actual industrial robot, not even designed to be a cobot. But it was adapted to an application as a medical device, and it's an interesting. It's it's actually a totally different take on cobots, right? Where you're actually using an industrial robot with no specific collaborative features, and because it's in a medical device, you can hone in the exact use case of the robot to the point where it is a cobot at that point, right? A doctor is working directly next to this thing in an operating uh, environment. Uh, it's an outpatient procedure, hair, hair transplant, so how tra- outpatient procedure, uh, where you're harvesting follicular units or hair follicles from the back of the head for transplant later to the front. And, you know, this thing is actually dissecting submillimeter precision right there while the patient is breathing and moving a little bit and tracking all of the vision systems. So that was my first exposure to uh, collaborative robots. And from that point, you know, laboratory automation, great use case for uh, collaborative robots. And, and I've just continued in that field from, from that point. Nice. Uh, for those that don't know Thermo Fisher, as I understand it, it's a $240 billion company. It's like, you know, one of the larger companies in the U S um, do they have their own cobots as well? Yes, we do. Yeah. We have a series of, of collaborative robots that are used for primarily laboratory automation applications. And, combination of research as well as what I would call production applications. Anytime you're doing batches, you can do batch processing of samples. They typically are done on micro titer plates and, and our robots optimized for driving that process of moving the micro titer plates from one station to the next or one instrument to the next. Got it. I noticed you're also the founder of a co-founder of the Kevin robot. Tell us more about that. Sure. Kevin Robot was really the, uh, it was a few of us that were involved in, in bringing Kevin Robot uh, to life. So I've, I actually got to know the Fraunhofer Institute in Germany over the course of my career as I was working in the life science industry. And there was an opportunity to work together with them uh, on a higher level with bringing to life uh, this idea of 
combining technologies. So Fraunhofer is a, a bit of a technology incubator, if you will, where they've had spinoff companies in various areas of both mobile robots as well as uh, mobile robot navigation and collaborative applications. So they have two spinoffs uh, that had already they've already spun out. They've become companies that are, are based in Stuttgart, one of which built a mobile robot platform, so a base that can – uh, essentially use omnidirectional wheels to navigate in any direction, right? The advantage of omnidirectional is you can, you can, you don't have to necessarily steer like a car. You can just shift left, right, forward, back at any time. Uh, so you have that additional flexibility. That's very handy to have in a tight space like you might have in a laboratory. That's key number one. N number two is a navigation company, and those don't necessarily grow on trees. Like software companies that have built out all the infrastructure to take all that sensory data and navigate into a room repeatably. Uh, that's also another company uh, that spun out of, of Fraunhofer. Taking those technologies, combining them into a robot with a robot, a mobile robot with a robot arm attached to the top. Now we have the ultimate flexibility to move things around in the lab intelligently, and that is the nature of Kevin Robots: the ability to uh, to to set up an experiment on the fly with different instruments in your lab. Uh, and you might just decide right before you go home for the night, I'm going to do a quick reader uh, load out of this array of plates and move it over to the reader on the other side. It'll be done by morning. I can even check in online to see what's happening. That's the whole basis for Kevin Robot. Nice. Sounds really useful. Awesome. Well, let's dive into the the, the topic of Cobotics. Um, if we could start with kind of the one-on-one, a little bit of the present, and then let's talk about the future. Just for those that aren't familiar with with uh, these types of robots, you know, what what is a Cobot? The term robot, we already know, has been kind of used for a lot of different things, from movies to uh, even, a, even a chat bot, right? They've, I've heard of chat bots, right? It could be a software thing. You know, originally a robot was intended to be a, you know, a, a mechanism that, that's, that's, you know, autonomous, right, in some way. Um, and, you know, a cobot, that term is still quite specific. It's a relatively new term utilized. Um, I haven't seen it kind of go off into a tangent area yet as far as what's being referred to as a cobot. But a, you know, a cobot is a, is a machine that's a, really approachable, right, by a, a human being. It also has an element of being easy to use. There's kind of two categories of cobot, right? You've got working with human beings or working alongside human beings. It may be fully automated and fully autonomous doing its own thing, but if a human needs to work or interact with it, Cobots allow that to happen uh, with less, um, let's say, fewer steps involved to transition from autonomous to non-autonomous operation. And then the other aspect is the ease of use, I think. And that's the, that's the one that kind of gets lost, right? Is, is what, what also came with Cobots was better software to define an application with fewer steps and also hone in on exactly what the user wants to do more quickly, but also integrate different technologies like grippers and things like that into one system. Also, less overhead, less technical um, uh, approach. This notion of interaction is, is for a lot of people to understand. That's like a new paradigm. Yes, in movies, we see R2-D2, C-3PO, and we see these like great examples of, of, you know, robots assisting humans, but it really hasn't been the history of robotics, right? In business, at least. Um, there's been a lot of consumer products that have failed, 99% failure rate, but, but you know, this is, this is actually relatively new. I, I, am I correct in saying that? Like, you know, cobots and like the prevalence of, of them actually growing in, in our businesses and our workplaces is more of a, a newer trend if we think about, you know, testing things versus the reality of using things. I, I would agree with that. And it's, I, I think cobots are inherently more difficult to find that, quote, killer app, right? You know, in, in, in the original, the original robot space had two primary applications. You know, it was packaging, high-speed SCARA, you know, cookies, you name it, food packaging. It's really been driven by the SCARA robot. It revolutionized uh, packaging and, and batch processing applications. And then in the automotive space, the articulated six degree of freedom robot was dominant. But when you can put a box around something and say, inside that box, I can count on humans not being there, then you've got basically carte blanche to go do whatever you want to do. 
uh, inside that box, and, and you can do it fast, you can do it efficient. Cobots are a little bit more vague in, in the killer apps you know, department, right? How do you apply that? You can't go as fast, generally, right? Because you've, you, you know, the laws of physics apply. If you have a fast robot, it weighs a lot. It's going to hit somebody. Doesn't matter how sensitive the joints are. There, it's 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 mass meets the other mass. Um, and then the other aspect is, you know, the organic nature of of applications. People say, I just want to make a cup of coffee in the morning. Robot people like me go, Do you realize what's involved in that? Uh, you know, opening the door, putting the coffee in, getting the grinder, all that stuff. I mean, there's a lot involved in that, and it, you know, that's why I think it tends to kind of go into you know, shoot high. Don't necessarily aim low, but be prepared to simplify, you know, at the end of the day. That's kind of the path that cobots have taken, in, in my opinion, so far. You know, you mentioned uh, life sciences. What are some other, if you think about the present day, what are some other applications of cobots that we see, you know, in the workplace? Well, I, I think bringing the right tools to the right place at the right time. Uh, if you've got resources that you need to bring around, this is really not even getting into um, having robotic arms attached to, you know, mobile bases. But, you know, I think mobile bases are getting better and better where you can put things on top where you've got maybe a set of tools. You know, the hospital industry has made huge use out of mobile transports inside of hospitals for prescription drugs that can be inherently dangerous just to even handle. So here you can put them in a locked away robot um, but, you know, just delivery to the right place at the right time has been one of the a huge application. And it's not a cobot in the sense of, of a robotic arm, but mobile robots are cobots too, right? They're, in, they're, they're going, they're moving, you know, if somebody stands in front of one, they go around, right? Automatically. They're working with humans, right? They're in and around Absolutely. humans and they're assisting, but they're, they're in and around humans versus locked away and like, you know. Totally. Logistics, you know, I, I see the logistics industry getting more and more intelligent and the application level pushing higher and higher as you're, because you, it's a lot of the day-to-day -day work and a lot of tasks is just moving things around from one place to the other, whether it's tools or raw materials uh, used for, for things. So, Some stats and trends have been showing that as a percentage of robot sales, Cobotics has been growing quite a bit, you know, in the last five years. What do you think is the key driver behind that trend? Um, what are like what are some things that are making that helping cobots grow? Uh, well, the, the the it's twofold. There's demand is there, so you you got to have that, and 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 the market is now educated. They understand what you can do. Um, they're not. It's not like a. When I first started in this space and, and really started following cobots, it was like, really? You're going to do that? I mean, yeah. and, and people were rightly skeptical. It's like, this is just an industrial robot that's called a cobot instead of a robot, right? That, that's really what it felt like to me early on. And it's slower, <laughs> yet it's easier to program. Then st people started figuring out, well, you don't necessarily need full-on speed for all applications. And in fact, there's a whole subset of applications where people are, have just traditionally ignored it because they know they're going to have to build out a whole infrastructure, a, a cage, sensors, safety technology, you know, almost a two-to-one ratio in terms of cost. You buy the robot for 25000 be prepared to spend another 25000 just to put it in the box, and then you got to program it on top of that. So, I think over time, people realize there's a whole bunch of subset of applications that were skipped over just because of that. And now, like I said, these machine tending applications and also laboratory applications where you just need the robot, a gripper, and maybe some storage, one-fifth the cost of all this caging and safety technology, and you can put it right next to the instrument and run it, uh, whether it's a machine tool or a laboratory instrument. It's basically the same application. It's machine tending. One might be five kilograms. The other one might be 500 grams. And, and that's, that I think is what opened the door big time is, is people saw that they saw there was an awareness around it and it just, you know, the, the, the doors were open to start doing it. It was always there from the beginning. Those applications were always there. They just got passed over because of all the uh, requirements. 
Periodically, we bring in other experts and industry leaders to get their take on the future. They were not involved in today's recording, but here's what they shared. Hi, I'm John Houston, and I'm the lead robotics engineer here at Fresh. Cobotics is a really broad term, and it's often visualized in arm-based scenarios, but it's more than that. I think that Cobotics is really going to take off in the realm of human augmentation. A vision system, for example, that keeps a heavy equipment operator from running over a person accidentally is just as much of a cobot as an arm helping to assemble cars on a factory floor. We don't need to take the human out of the equation completely. Anything that makes the human more efficient, safer, etc., is a huge gain. And to be limited by this false barrier of full autonomy before anybody sees it, right? is silly and I think that it's really limiting the development of a lot of great technology. Obviously a lot of the robotics technology is advanced, but you know, being able to work alongside humans and know that hey that could be safe now, like what what do you see as some of the key technology that advanced that made that even easier or faster or cheaper? Um I I think the well two things. One, the software has gotten way better. Um, so, robot, you know, there, there's something that, that revolu revolutionized the mobile telephone industry. It's called the software defined radio, and and I would say uh, in robotics we have the software defined robot controller, where you now have the ability with a, a a robot controller to go in and control almost every major control parameter for, you know, the joints, how they're controlled, the force management, right, being able to mitigate collisions and things like that. Uh, it's from even from 10 years ago, processing power is so good that you can do current loop, uh, you can do voltage loop, all, all the uh, dynamic control at very high rates in real time with something that costs not that much, right? And, and that has really revolutionized like how you can bring this technology to market uh, with a relatively reasonable price and the software to do it, right? The program, the robot has come come up so well that you know you don't necessarily have to have a programming background to work with these machines right you need to you still need to work through the process of what you want to do with the robot and some of the mechanics of it but the training the, the barrier to entry on training is way lower uh than it used to be in, in that case i think it's one of the the big factors that has a little bit to do with the hardware but it's really on the software side that i think is has brought it to market uh, in, in a bigger way. And they said the future of robots is probably software, right? You know, as, as, as price comes down, as, as all the uh, types of robots, you know, become more available, you know, I'd see that, that continued advance. Um, I guess, you know, you think about the our smartphone, right? It's like once you have that platform, it's like the proliferation of the apps made those things, you know, oh, definitely. Way, way, way more useful. Um you know, it's interesting that on our team, we've been working on where you are, this notion of like where you are in a indoor space as well as where you are from outdoor space. And we've been focused on like small degrees, like precision accuracy, but that, that's actually been a hard problem um, to do well. And you had mentioned the, 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 you know, the Institute in Germany that, that has some serious software about, you know, navigation and kind of where you are and that sort of thing. And, and then the, the usability software about programming things of what, what do you want it to do? Um, but uh, I think the, mo the mobility and navigation of like where you are, I think we've been watching that advance for like, like the last five years. And I think as we think about robots running around us and getting to where they need to go and then, you know, picking something up and going someplace else, right? Um, that seems to be a major advance as well to support cobotics that aren't in a single space, right? And uh, you're, you're seeing that, right, in, in life sciences, right? Like, the, you know, a robot being able to go to another place accurately and grab something, I mean, that that's come a long way in the last 10 years, right? Yeah, that was really what got me so interested in, in the Kevin Ro Robot concept was, you know, for years I'd seen in academic papers, you know, I've been following the robot industry ever since, you know, the mid-90s. And I, I, you know, the Robotics and Automation Journal, there are all these applications for mobile manipulation. But the biggest, the kind of the, the, the breaker in the whole deal to get it commercialized was always around resolving 
the last you know few centimeters essentially the last inch let's just say and it's like the last mile in cable and fiber optics same thing it was the last inch in mobile robots that always basically made a robot arm attached to a mobile base less useful so this this idea of where we've got camera technology that's in the thousands of dollars it's embedded. I don't need another processor for it or another computer. I can put it on board a mobile platform and really get full power out of the robot arm that's sitting on top of that mobile platform. That's a game changer. And doing that in, in real time for from one station to the next without having to really train the user any, any differently on how to teach the robot, they can, they can run this process and, and not worry about it. So that, that's definitely a huge game changer to take it to the next level who are some of the biggest kind of cobotic producers i know thermo fisher um does ha- has some product lines around this and kind of focused in life sciences it seems like but who are some of the other big um kind of cobot producers in the world that you think sure. you should be watching yeah there there's really uh, there's two categories there there's uh, companies that were built on the foundation of being cobot companies to begin with I think the number one is going to be Universal Robots out of Denmark. Uh, no doubt about it. They've they've grown, and I've I've watched them grow in, in time. Uh, another one is my former employer used to be called Precise Automation. It's now owned by Brooks. Uh, Brooks Automation is famous for semiconductor robots. Uh, we we were purely a collaborative robot company, right? We didn't uh, when we got into that space just because of the life science industry primarily, and you know the. Um, that company was actually founded by some of the original people in the robotic space who started an industrial robot company. So we saw both ends, Brian Carlisle and Bruce Shimano uh, founded Precise. And so, you know, that was really cool to work with them because they themselves learned a lot, you know, transitioning into collaborative only. And then you've got the industrial companies that are still primarily known for their industrial product lines, KUKA, Fanuc, ABB, uh, you know, but they've created what they call Cobot product lines. I still don't see any of those actually being a, a, a real dominant factor. I mean, they all kind of share a little bit of pie, you know, all adds up to a fairly large piece, but nothing like what I think UR has done and, and, um, uh, you know, a, a couple other companies that uh, Techman is another one uh, which works with the depth technology, a lot of Omron. I mean, that's, yeah. And you, you also see a lot of similar robots coming out of China that don't really have a major play in the North American or European market. But if you just look at uh, Asia and APAC alone, they actually start representing a, a pretty significant quantity of robots that aren't ever, aren't even exported. Let's transition a little bit to the future. Um, as we think about you know different industries that that might have some of the most rapid adoption, do you have any perspectives on where we really see robotics uh, taking off? Um, well, I see I see the food uh, food service as one um, that's you know interesting for for cobots. Um, you know, I, I've been watching that for 20 years and it seems like finally now there's enough interest from the companies to, to do that. Um, you know, I, I, I almost, I actually, you know, filled out the application to work for uh, McDonald's engineering years ago. Uh, you know, they actually have a full on engineering group uh, that is, you know, completely um, everything you see in a McDonald's is purely engineered for McDonald's. That's it, right? So I think that kind of attitude or that approach lends itself to doing more automation. It's just taken a long time to kind of adopt it. Uh, so that's one area that I, I think is can finally grow a bit. The technology is there and the interest is there. Um, I also see the, the lab, you know, for me, the laboratory is just in the beginning stages, right? It's a Low payload applications are some of the best applications for cobots, right? If you're if you're moving fifty kilos, that's probably not a good cobot application. But if you're moving five or less, that's that that works out well because you don't have to build a mechanism that's heavy, and you can use control methods that lend themselves to speed and still remaining collaborative at the same time. 
you can't, you know, you can make anything collaborative if it just depends on how slow you want, want it to go. Uh, so I think this, you know, the low payload electronics market is another one. Electronics is a lot like the lab. You do a lot of testing. You do a lot of uh, batch processing. Um, so, so electronics test is a great fit for collaborative robots. And, and, and there's already been several applications. You don't see them as much. They're not as, uh, I think, visible, but they're definitely happening there behind the scenes and growing. Um, yeah, so there's, there's a couple of examples that I see as uh, future drivers for cobots. I'm Avinash Singh. I'm a senior robotics engineer at Fresh Consulting. Farming is another interesting area with potential cobotic applications. We are seeing more and more cobotic applications on account of increased dexterity of the robots. With the rise in vertical farming and other botanical advancements, we should see an increase in cobotic applications in these areas. What do you think will be um, one of the big steps forward for cobotics? Like, are there you know some technologies still that like? Obviously, we, we've had just this rapid confluence of, of technology in, in the last 15 years uh, coming together to make things faster, easier for, for robots in general, uh, cheaper. Uh, but w what else do you think is sort of on the verge that will help things really grow? Or do you think we already have the technology, it's just sort of a matter of time? Well, I equate it to the uh, autonomous car industry, right? Uh, there's sort of the last 1%. Of, of, of that, you know, we see, oh, 99%, it's fine. 1%, not so much. So that 1% is going to take a lot of time. I, 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 I hold, hold fast on that, that opinion about the, the whole um, awareness, this, the awareness around the, the machine, whatever it is, whether it's a car or, or a robotic arm. I think awareness is another area where, you know, the next step for, from, collaborative robots where you've got better tools kind of like the tools that you have that help you drive a car better the lane management the thing that beeps at you when you're closing rates too fast with the car in front of you or with the car behind you if you're backing up either way you know these awareness and, and mitigation technologies took years to get in installed in the vehicles but they're tremendously helpful i think with with robots awareness technology and the ability to do uh more sophisticated auto teaching also you know basically giving the user the ability to you know present the part in a very in a less precise way and still get a reliable outcome uh, this area is still very kind of top-down approach right your machine vision is it depends on a lot of things being right before everything else works out right and i think you know getting that fewer things that you have to get exactly right speeds things up at the end of the day right you can you can more fluidly go in and move to the next step in any given process and i i think it's just that that connection to the the human if it's a cobot right you've got human interaction as part of the process the setup process is also part of the process even though you're you're not doing it as often that's an area that still could use a lot of work right make it easier to use the robot implement the robot yeah yeah that makes sense. It's interesting to think about the, it's not, maybe not just the robot itself and it advancing. It's all that, that contextual stuff around you and how you, how the robot interfaces with, you know, its context, right? Human interactability and usability is an often overlooked but crucial aspect of Cobotics. We need to start looking past the simple buttons and screens to more of a human form of interaction. For example, if I were going to hand something to a person, they would see what I was doing and instinctively reach out to receive it from me. I think that by making these robot interactions intuitive, we open doors to more robotic applications. As we think about the future, like 10 to 20 years from now, like what, what, are, what are some of your like, what do you envision, um, you know, if we jump forward in you know, the next 10 to 20 years? Well, I, I think the uh, electromechanical uh, components used in robots could, you know, there's, there's definitely 
some improvements to be made there. Um, we've been really working off of harmonic gearboxes and robot arms for a long time. They're kind of, you know, in, in a lot of ways, clunky, high, you know, reflected inertia. And what I mean by, you know, reflected inertia, where you've got essentially uh, an inability to sense what's happening on the end of the joint at the motor level. So, so to, you know, a lot of cobots that have any payload and, and, and sensing technology, unless it's direct drive, unless there's no gearbox at all, uh, you have this isolation and, and it, it just makes the control more clunky, right? So direct drive is really take, going to the next level right now. There's a few technologies that have come on the market where you're able to get more power out of a direct drive where you can eliminate the gearbox on major joints in a robot. Seems like a small thing, but not having this 50 to 1 gear ratio is is huge, right? I mean, we've seen it with electric cars just in the drive mechanism. The reliability of an electric drive where you've got no gearbox, right, in a in a <laughs> I mean, you're getting amazing torque, amazing power, no gearbox, no transmission, all these valves and things well, a gearbox is the same way. You know, if a gearbox gets struck, if you get damage from a collision, that uh, harmonic gearbox is toast, right? It's basically, you got to pull it apart, replace it. And I think, you know, those are things that people think about. It's like, what's the maintenance cost of this machine, right? And I think for cobots, because the payloads are so low, you can go, you can eliminate gearboxes with a with a technology, but we're already seeing it. There's some robots on the market now that are using major joints that have uh, direct drive. So I think that's a, that's a big step. Uh, it'll simplify the design of robots and give people a lot more flexibility. And then also shrinking the controllers. The, the electronics, we've already seen it, but most of the cobots, the, the large players in the cobots, still have a, I would say a small box, you know, maybe a 5U rack mount computer box that's still attached to it with an umbilical cable, all that. Yep, you know, that's going to go too uh, across the board, I think. I think people will be able to embed the controllers. There's a few players that are doing it now, but, you know, from a cost standpoint, to be competitive, you're not going to be able to sell a robot plus another box if, if the trend in the industry is moving away from that. Aided by the multifold increase in sensing and computing capabilities, we've seen a rising focus in areas of general purpose robotics. Research groups and companies are focusing on creating robots with capabilities to handle multiple tasks and scenarios by themselves. For example, a robot would know the difference between handling a delicate piece of kitchen equipment to opening a door versus picking a heavier object. There's also focus on getting a robot to be able to navigate in a small space without the need for an extensive mapping mission or extensive technology or technical support. All this points to a robot that would have the capabilities to aid in general tasks. With Japan funding companies to create robots specifically for elder care, we can expect to see a rise in these types of cobots that help with daily household activities and aid the elderly with picking up, let's say, heavier stuff and making their lives a bit better. Do you see cobots, you know, replacing any jobs in the future? Um, you know, is there just helping us be more productive? So maybe one person doesn't need the two hire as many people because they have more support. They're more productive themselves. Um, any thoughts? A lot of people fear robots and, and they hear cobots and it's like, oh, so maybe like a multiplier of fear. Um, but, um, you know, if you think about dirty, dull, dangerous, it kind of makes sense. But as we think about the emergence of robots kind of working in and around us, any thoughts on the economy or jobs and how that, you know, how that things could be affected? Uh, no, I, I don't really see any applications where it's a, a true one-to-one -one replacement of people. I mean, you know, in the case of the machine tending application, most companies have actually increased their headcount, even though they've adopted several cobots. Uh, and that's that's a that's a, a very big space for universal robots and, and other industrial, what I would call industrial cobot companies. 
that's that's huge in that you're able to allow a better, more skilled people to leverage their skill across the company better than they would have if they were came in as a machine tending uh, or, or a machine tender or somebody who's handling the machine tool. Now they can work with multiple systems all at the same time thanks to the cobot. That's not really a replacement. That's just growth through cobots. Same thing in the, uh, well, similar argument, but also different at the same time in the lab space where you've got processes that would be impossible, absolutely impossible to do with humans. So I, I, I was just looking at a system the other day, a high throughput screening system, it's two robots fitting in the space of a, let's say, a, I don't know, this, this room here. And they're doing the work of a hundred people that would take 10 times as much time and have a whole bunch of errors and mistakes that the robots would never make to be able to do. That's life science. Life science, you can't do this stuff with humans. Simple, simple as that. The, the technology is enabled thanks to the cobots. Interesting. So it's possible that, you know, more and more cobots could also create jobs because you are more productive. You're generating more output. So you can, you can actually hire people to do more skilled work. Does that seem Absolutely. like a fair yeah. assumption? It's a win-win. As far as I, as far as I can tell, yeah. Nice. That that's fun to think about as we think about the, uh, this space growing. The less talked about side of cobotics is humans helping robots versus the other way around. If you have a solution to a robotics problem, but you're stuck on the last few challenges of it, say for example, your robot navigates it carries out an inspection mission, but there's one door along the path that it can't open on its own, then have it ask for help. There are people out there focusing on full end-to-end -end autonomy and considered a failure whenever it doesn't perform as such. They're putting so much time in developing solutions that could have already been deployed in collecting data for future durations, stress testing their chassis, testing all the other functionality they have and improving it instead of grinding to a halt because they can't open a door. Humans can help robots just as much as they help us. This has been a great conversation. I have a few kind of few more questions before we kind of wrap up. Um, one is, what do you think would be like one of the coolest experiences uh, with cobots? Like, what's like a really cool use case that you can think about? I had the opportunity to use the world's first pneumatic cobot. Which is uh, uh, it's a machine that's built by a company in Esslingen, Germany. It's called Festo, and it's actually I always kind of wrote it off as pneumatics are so uh, it's so odd to think of a robot actually being powered by pneumatic en you know energy, and the abil ability to actually servo a pneumatically controlled or pneumatically powered joint. Well, they've they've it, it's got some work, you know. They're they're working on some things, but. It's incredibly smooth. And I, I, I thought this thing could be amazing for orthopedic recovery, right? Anyone, right? Anyone needs to go through a motion because I've never felt a robotic arm so buttery smooth when all six degrees of freedom. And this thing could replicate. Let's say I've got a problem in my wrist. You could actually do a therapeutic movement where it's guided through this very smooth range of motion, whereas with these these harmonic-driven robots would just be so clunky and jolty and you'd have variations, hysteresis in the, in the forces applied. So to, to me, I thought that would be kind of, you know, it would, to me it would be a really next-level use case as well as, take, you know, giving a, a practical application for the pneumatics uh, right out of the gate if we, if we could make that happen. I think that'd be cool. That's cool. I think as we think about the problems in the future around aging and, uh, you know, taking care of our, our elderly family uh, or population in general, obviously Japan's working on this a lot right now, but that seems, that seems to be, uh, you know, a, a game changer type of technology that could, that could play a big role in the future. Yeah, it's, it's been interesting to watch what they've done in Japan with, uh, you know, assistive robots, you know, Toyota, Honda, they've all had projects around that and some amazing r&d has come from that i mean you know what boston dynamics has done the fact that the robot can be pushed over get up on its own 
and it doesn't even it doesn't bother it at all. It just keeps on going, and and you've got Spot walking around the streets, uh, navigating all by itself. I mean, th- those are. I mean, that's beyond novelty. I'll have to say. I mean, yeah, the videos are fun to watch, but I mean, the R and D that's coming from that is 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 amazing, and I'd love to see, you know, more true human contact applications with robots like physiotherapy and and things like that because that's one that gets overlooked right it's like but the robot mechanisms the software defined robot controller you can drive a robot today through any arbitrary trajectory in space passively or actively um, with this control technology and it really kind of is underutilized at this point it's kind of like a, a solution without a problem you know but i think the problem can be brought to the solution in this case. We've mostly been focused on robots that look like robot arms and AMRs that go around places. I'd also like to bring up miniature scale robots. These are still in research phases, but there are a lot of research groups that have started using miniature scale robots as surgery aids that can be released in a human body and travel to a certain part and get imaging or attack a tumor and stuff like that. This would be an amazing area to see growth in and this would be an indispensable tool once it's more usable to a surgeon and the group of doctors that today have to perform an invasive surgery may not need to do that in the future. As someone who's been in this space for, for, for almost 20 years, and, and then you can kind of see the future with the trends as well, is there anything you haven't told us that you think is important as we think about the future of robotics? Um, I would just say, you know, as with any field that's relatively uh, young, you know, watch out for the hype and, and kind of look for the practicality in, in things. Um, I think a lot of a lot of things can get overhyped as far as their uh, application. It tends to pull people out of the space where they can definitely, uh, as a business, make money. Most importantly, as an engineer, get the satisfaction of a successful application and not shoot too far. Because there's a lot a lot that gets missed uh, when we shoot too far. And I'm, I'm not saying, you know, obviously, shoot for the sky, right? The sky is the limit. I'm, I'm a fan of that, you know, go long. But... You know, also in a in a practicality sense, I think it's also worth just you know stepping back and going, well, wait, there's a whole business here we're we're passing by because I've seen that myself with with working with collaborative robots for most of my career, where I'm just like, there's this whole area I just haven't been seeing because I didn't want to see it. I've been I've been looking too far ahead. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense, I think. You know, any advice for those that want to get more involved in Cobotics? Um, This is an emerging space. It's a fast-growing space. Um, What would you say, you know, maybe from conferences or books or podcasts, like any thoughts on, you know, how do I get more involved? Yeah, there's there's a few few things I have in mind. I think the uh, uh, one of the best is just uh, going somewhere where you can kind of see how these things are used, right? I mean, not even, you know, universities are getting better and better. Uh, In fact, we, my first job, we donated robots, right, to universities around the area, which was cool because these, these, you know, people got exposure right away. They remembered the robots. It actually resulted in business later on, right? So it's good for, good for business as well. Um, But, you know, having a look at where these things are used um i would say you know one of my favorites is the 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 laboratory automation conferences and the smaller cobot focused conferences um, are great examples of seeing these things actually in use and and in, in a way that you never would have imagined where you know you're you're basically taking a robot and one one robot is doing the work of 100 people simultaneously right and you can uh you know get to know that you know there's i think there's a lot of ways to you know if you have a particular interest in a in a market for me the automotive industry drew me in turned out turned out within a few years i had nothing to do with the automotive industry as far as robots so you know it just was a starting point right and i and i realized there were all these other opportunities but i i can't 
I cannot knock working for a robot company. It you will see more things because as, you know the applications for for especially the articulated robots are nearly endless, right? And that kind of exposure gives you, I think, the best perspective possible. Um, and guess what? They're hiring. Uh, that's that's a space that's growing. Electromechanical background is the ideal, but either one of those, or even a programming background. You know, some of my, you know, most um, talented colleagues I've ever worked with actually came from pure software uh, that work in the robot space, right? So that says that that speaks to that, right? I like I like this notion of picking something you're passionate about. You said automotive, and then thinking about the adjacent robotics field if you're interested in robotics like because there's so many use cases and so much happening there might just be the convergence of those two right for sure uh, that's what happened yeah. for me i it happened not to be in the in the automotive space uh, ultimately but i would never would have discovered it had i not pursued that that idea okay nice one last question um and that is as we think about designing the future with more intent. You know, technology has a life of its own. It's, it's often outpacing humans and their ability to adapt. Uh, but as we think about this space, can you think of any principles that are important so that we design cobots with intent? If we're going to be working a lot more with robots in the future and they're designed to be working with us, can you think of any like principles that we want to get right so we don't get it wrong? I think we constantly are trying to catch up and realize, whoa, like, you know, hey, we're, we're, we're ch- actually checking these things, you know, 343 times a day on average. Is that a good thing? You know, like <laughs> and, uh, st- stuff like that. Like, h- how do we design the future of robotics with, with more intent? Well, I, I think it, it requires the exact opposite of looking at something so divert, like, you know, you're talking about like a mobile phone, right? There's so many different things your, your brain can be drawn to on that one screen, You've got the news, you've got the weather, you've got work, you've got emails, right? All those things, all, that, that none of which all converge, right? I think thinking with convergence in mind is really the most powerful thing you can do uh, in general, and, and it really applies to robotics. Having spent so much time in this industry, you're, it's so important to focus, right, d- down to... You know, look, look at things from different angles, and that's applying robots is really a function of multiple disciplines, but also, you know, subjecting the concept to uh, the scrutiny from different perspectives, right? So you're looking at the, you know, pick and place application, even the simple pick and place application. You're looking at, okay, what am I handling? Does it have a sharp edge? Can I use a tapered? Uh, you know, a lead in on my, my placement nest, the gripper. We're talking about slippery is, will a vacuum work? Do we have a flat surface? That kind of thing where you're just really fixated on, on, on the details of that and the success that comes from looking at the details in the robot space. I don't care what dimension it is, whether it's software controls, the mechanics, Every single aspect of robotics and the application of robots benefits from this detailed thinking, right? And and it's it sometimes gets lost, right? Um, when you're kind of just oh, I, I've got that covered. Let's move on to the next thing. You know, really pick it up, turn it around in your hand a bit, and before you you are, say you're settled on a particular uh, approach. Thank you for that advice and, and all your experience and, and wisdom. Um, as we think about the future of of cobots and cobotics again thank you for being here uh as a you know a specialist in the space it's been great to have you loved hearing your thoughts absolute pleasure thank you for having me the future of podcast is brought to you by fresh consulting to find out more about how we pair design and technology together to shape the future visit us at freshconsulting.com make sure to search for the future of an apple podcast spotify Google Podcasts or anywhere else podcasts are found. Make sure to click subscribe so you don't miss any of our future episodes. And on behalf of our team here at Fresh, thank you for listening.